Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. <clears throat> you may know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very interesting one. It's a series that are, is prepared for the use during the months of January, February, and March of 2016. We're now ready for Lesson 3 in that series entitled Global Rebellion and the Patriarchs. This lesson is for January 16 of 2016. Before we begin, we hope you have your Bible handy. You may want to look at some of the verses we're going to look at. We hope we don't want to misrepresent anything here. But we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we pray. Our wonderful Father, it's incredible to imagine the struggles that you have been through, putting up with all of our craziness, through down to history. Now as we look at some of the things that have happened to us, uh, all the way from creation to the flood and so forth, we just wonder how you managed to have such patience. Help us now to understand the stories and what we should learn from them is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to cover the whole book of Genesis here in one lesson. Uh, that is, we're going to pick a few spots out of the book of Genesis. I need to be more, more honest. And we need to remember that in this series, we're talking about the great controversy over God's character and his government. So as we study the great controversy, think about that for a moment, it will be very important for us to think not only about God's role in each of these stories, but also Satan's role. You can't study a war and really understand what's going on unless you at least give a cursory look at both sides of that battle. What did the creatures that surround God's throne in heaven think about what God was doing? I mean, in Revelation, we read about the four living creatures, we read about the 24 elders, and of course there are thousands of angels that are just, I'm sure, standing there waiting to do God's will. Well, at the same time, they're watching what's happening down here, what do they think about what's happening here? Do they give any feedback to God? Do they say, God, what in the world are you doing? You know, I, I don't know if they would be that kind of tone, but do they <laughs> at least have that question in their mind? Um, what do they think about what Satan was doing? Well, we start off with Genesis 4. And in Genesis 4, we have the story of Cain and Abel. And you remember the story, they bought offerings, Cain brought his vegetables and maybe some fruits, we don't know for sure. And Abel brought that lamb and sacrificed it. So the first question I want to ask you, do you think this was the first time a lamb was offered? No. Why do you say that? Because that's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you think, okay. Um, <coughs> where's some, the text? Some of the things that have been stated before are you know, God probably demonstrated what death was, mm -hmm. what the shedding of blood was, uh, to show them there are, the results of sin, and the, yeah. this, the clothes that he made for Adam and Eve, did they, come, they must have come from an, well, they probably came from an animal, but maybe he wove them from, without killing them. Yeah, have you ever thought about that process? I don't want to take a long time on this, but did he, you know, kill the animal, skin it, God, did God show them how to do that? Did he show them how to cure the, the wool? Did he show them how to cure the leather? Did he prepare it nicely? I mean, and did he show them how to do all that kind of stuff? I mean, you know how leather would become, just in a few days, it would be unwearable if you just put it on and start wearing it. So just some questions to think about that we don't need to discuss right here. Now, weren't offerings the whole animal, not the skinned animal? Well... I mean, that's a question. Sacrifices. M many of them were, but not all of them. Yeah. So, you know, if that's the case, then he would have had, God would have had to either kill some animals without using the sacrifices or created some skins. I think he could do that. Absolutely. Well, but at the, at the same, to follow that line of thinking up, um, did... Uh, did um, did Abel just concoct this business of 
of, I mean, we have no information that I know of, scriptural information, where there was instruction to Abel to, okay, this is what I want you to do with this. So, uh, another question that we might ask here is, did, is this another classic example of humans coming up with some works idea to, to justify themselves before God? Is, was this animal sacrifice Cain's idea? Well, no, you mean Abel's idea. Yes, Abel's idea. Yeah. Well, of course, for those of us who take seriously the writings of Ellen White, she says specifically that right outside the gates of the garden, God instructed Adam and Eve how they were to offer sacrifices and what it was supposed to mean and the meaning of the death and sin leading to death and so forth. So if you want to take that seriously, then that answers those questions. And right by right outside the garden, you mean as soon as sin entered, uh, right. as soon as humans sinned. So, um, and we could spend a long time, which I, we don't have time to do now, discussing <coughs> the universe looking on and watching Eve, wandering away from Adam, looking at the tree, discussing with the serpent, and what was going through their minds as they knew what was involved as they watched all of that. Well, try to imagine, here's something else to think about, try to imagine being one of a Adam's and Eve's children, living at a time when there are more, no more than a handful or two of people living on the whole earth, and Satan and his entire host have just you to work on. Does that sound exciting? <coughs> Full of problems, I would <laughs> Full of problems. Of course, God and all his hosts have the, you know, have the same... Do you think they were fighting over access to the human beings? No. Are we talking before sin or after sin here? No, after sin, right after sin. Well, wouldn't they, wouldn't they be attacking, I mean, you know, the effects of sin not only affected Adam and Eve, but they began to fact all, all of nature. Yeah. Now, is, sure. that, is that Satan poking around, or is that some kind of a At natural consequence? or Probably both. Trying to store, destroy, every, destroy everything yeah. in which the image of God was... Uh, well, one of the questions that our lesson asks is, what did you think of Cain's response to God in comparison to Adam? How did Adam and Eve respond right after they sinned and God came looking for them? They hid. They hid because they were... They didn't embarrassed, have clothes of guilty, of white. Shame, shame, ashamed, all of the afraid, above. all of the above. Yeah. How did Cain respond? Sorry. How would you describe his response? He's pretty uh, belligerent. Angry, bitter. He was cynical, rebellious, kind defiant. In, yeah, kind of in your face. Yeah. Rebellious and defiant. What a, Am I supposed to take care of him? Yeah, exactly. Well, soon there was another born, another son born by the name of Seth, and he ended up being a wonderful replacement for Abel. Um, but we know very, we almost, we know almost nothing about what happened before the flood, except that things deteriorated just incredibly badly in a relatively short period of time. Um, how do you explain that? Shortness? Well, the deterioration. I mean, uh, you're, looking, you're looking at Adam and Eve, and they're living in the Garden of Eden. They, make the, they do this one sin. They're outside the garden, and you blink a couple of times, and God's ready to drown the whole world in the flood. How did that happen? We're talking about the great controversy now. We've got to understand these things. Is it because... Uh, talking about what happened to the... To human the humans, or, yeah, or the what human happened race. to the squirrels and rabbits? I'm more concerned about what happened to the humans. And the question is, uh, that I would come, is are we born naturally sinful and selfish? What does that mean if we are? And if God left us completely alone, will we all self-destruct? Yeah, without instruction. Well, that's a that's a big that's a big puzzle. It seems as if some kind of a a switch was turned on or turned off or something, so that uh, 
we humans, there's nothing we can do to straighten things out or straighten ourselves out. We seem to be hell-bent for, for evil. They say we're before the flood. Without the active hand of God, we would die immediately. Every, yeah. as you've quoted, every pulse, pulsation of the heart is a rebound of the touch of God or something like that. Yeah, yeah but every then you also got the issue of if uh, no man, what is it this, there in the Jeremiah, the, the man is con exceedingly sinful, yeah. every, every thought that he has, and so left to unchecked or left uneducated is going to self-destruct or destroy everybody else. Okay, so now the question I want to ask you, and that's a very important point, is that because Satan would take control if God backed off, or are we naturally like that? I, th I don't think Satan has to do a lot. I think <laughs> human nature would ultimately self-destruct. You remember what James 1 says. Yeah. God <laughs> we, can do it, we can do it to ourselves, right? Yeah. Well, in the midst of that terrible deterioration, we have who? We have Enoch, who we know about, and Noah. Genesis 5, 21 to 24, and Genesis 6, 9 to 10 say that those two men walked with God. What does it mean to walk with God? You know, you raised a question, and that is the nature of sin and how it affects us. Is this... Is this is this sin thing just loose and, and Satan doesn't have anything to do with it? He can aggravate it. He can set up uh, the environment to where it is exacerbated. Uh, um, the idea that the devil made me do it really isn't, isn't a valid argument. Or in some cases, I really don't have any. In some cases, I don't have a whole lot of choice myself. I, I, to answer that, I might, I might tell the story of a young boy who was kicking and hitting and spitting on his younger brother. And his mother came rushing out and she said, Johnny, do you realize what you're doing? He says, the devil must make you do this. And he says, well, the kicking and the hitting were Satan's idea, but the spitting was my idea. <laughs> hmm. I mean, you know, we could, we could do it. We can do a pretty bad job all by ourselves. You know, when you go through Genesis, though, there there's, appears to be kind of two sides. Um, one they call the sons of God, and the other is the sons of men. Daughters of men. Yeah, daughters of men. There, there seems to be kind of a two groups. And then towards the flood, the, the group that was more to God kind of molded into the other one. And then that's when... The flood happened. Mm -hmm. It was pretty interesting. Well, if you read Genesis 6, it says, finally, God could, quote, bear it no longer. You asked and the question, what does it mean to walk with God? And yeah. I didn't hear you answer that. You didn't hear me? I asked you. <laughs> we got off track. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think clearly it means, if, if I take a walk with you, what would that mean? We're, we're walking along. We're not just walking. We're probably going to be talking, we're going to be thinking, we're going to be sharing ideas, right? I think that's exactly what Enoch and Noah did. They, they thought about God a lot. They thought about God a lot. That's right. In fact, probably all the time. They spent my, a lot of time with him in prayer and maybe yeah. even closer than that. And, Ellen uh, White tells us that Enoch would have times, he, he just couldn't tolerate the, the, the sinful environment that was going on in the world. He would go apart. He would hide himself somewhere. I don't know exactly where. Go off somewhere and commune with God. So, well, let me go back to my other question. What does it mean God could bear it no longer? Does that mean God lost control of his emotions? No. Well, we're wonder. not real comfortable with that idea, are we? I wonder if the translators got the right word on that. <laughs> well, you have to talk, we're talking in human terms, so uh, mm -hmm. you know, has, God has to communicate to finite beings. So, of course, then the question is, why did he send the flood? Or why did he let the flood happen? Yeah. How... Oh, overt does he have to be? Can he just withdraw... 
his protection. Well, if you stop and look at what happened to Flood, the few words that we have, basically he, un he undid almost all of creation, just rolled it back, more or less. The waters came together, the birds and the, and, and the sea creatures came together, and now they're all of them drowning, uh, you know. So again, is that God actively doing that, or is that the devil, and this is a monotheistic description of the Bible, God did it? Well, now let's think about this for a moment. Yeah, this, I'm going to take you up on that challenge. That's a good question. If you were Satan, and you he saw what... You to undo everything God had done. Well, think about this for a moment. Satan believed that he was just on the verge of winning the great controversy. There was like one family still listening to him. He said, let's just... Go. If I were Satan, I would say, forget the flood. If, if I have to have any responsibility for it, Go about one more generation, and this whole world would be mine. I'm not going to send any flood. Wouldn't you think like that? I mean, he's a smart guy. He's not rational. And he'd never seen death. <laughs> he's, no, but he's no, not dumb either. No intelligent creature had ever seen death prior to that time. So Not, but, uh, not prior to the flood. They'd seen death prior to the flood. Yeah, 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 that's true. Of course, it was uh, yeah. enabled. But I mean, prior to, prior to the creation of this earth, they'd never seen death. Yeah. And they knew that they if, uh, felt that they were probably a, a different, higher order, so to speak, than, than these humans that were created to try to. Well, the, question, the question is this, and I, I, I want you to come to grips with this. Don't you think that Satan really thought he had about won the great controversy just before the flood happened? Yes. Well, and, and made the argument to what we say the onlooking universe, look, yeah. you see, yeah. it, it, people cannot, these beings cannot live up to the standards of God's They universe. don't even want to. Well, yeah. you're, you're, you're saying that God came and stopped it right before the last person went. Isn't that cheating? Well, that's exactly what mm -hmm. Satan said. Mm -hmm. That's cheating. Well, is it? it was if, if, if he's going after what you think he's going after, wouldn't that be cheating? Well, and obviously we're thinking of big global things here. But well, uh, well, what, what do you think Satan would prefer? Does he want a world full of peop dead people? Or would he rather have a world full of people who are following him? I don't know. Maybe he wants a world full of dead people. I'm not quite sure I don't yet. Think he's that dumb. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I mean, he, it's it's not. It may not be. That's what he wants. He may want the what God to look like he's failed, and he doesn't care if there's people living or not. I mean, in fact, if they all died and they look like it looks like God failed. That's what he'd want more than anything. Well, and he has he has the rest of the universe. His argument would be. You can see that this system fails, so everybody should follow. Everybody else should follow me. Yeah. Which I, that, that our understanding of what God is and how He sustains everything. You, you wonder how Satan could ever even think such a thing could. Uh, well, another exist. possibility is that if you have an onlooking universe looking at these obstinate humans down there. One question that could come up, well, why don't we just wipe them out, mm -hmm. you know, and just get out all the, the good people, and that'll fix everything. Well, is it going to do world. that or not? All one of them. Well, what ends up happening is that, that Noah becomes Adam again yeah. after the flood, and the whole thing starts over. Instead of having a Garden of Eden, you've got an ark where all these animals are coming out. Mm -hmm. So you got the whole thing starting over again. Okay, so now I'm going to put the question to you. If you had been God, what would you have done? Just what God did. It depends what you <laughs> think. It depends what you think he has to do. What well, he has to accomplish. You. That's why I'm asking you. Well, but the... the, the, the We're talking about great controversy here. God's <laughs> interference here is no greater or lesser than his interference in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were supposed to die. Mm -hmm. And he stepped in there mm -hmm. and saved them. Saved the entire human race. Right. And so now he's stepping in once again 
So it's really, he's not cheating now any more than he cheated before. If so you're you going to cheat once, you can cheat again. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like what Gary said. This was, except I'll expand it just a little bit maybe, the, the flood was a rescue mission. Uh -huh. The ark and the flood was a rescue mission to take that one family, that one person maybe, mm -hmm. and, and his family so he could procreate. Shem seemed to have been doing pretty well. And we don't know much about Japheth. Yeah. Ham has some problems. Yeah, there, there was some troublesome family, but to take this family and, as Gary said, start over again. Yeah. And it, God has done that several times down through the time, the Babylonian captivity. Well, down to Egypt and the Babylonian Abraham? captivity. Abraham before that, yeah. It's over and How over again. How many times again. is, I mean, is God just going to go on forever? And when, when our world gets so bad once again, he's going to wipe us all out and pick out a few people that maybe are listening to him and start over again? All, so, because, no, all because Noah was, was righteous. Isn't there one text in, Je in Revelation that says there will be no more death? Yes. Outside of the, and if Revelation the natural result of separation from God is death, and it says there will be no more death, and we, if we can believe that, then apparently there, we, it's well, not illogical to think that the mess is, is behind yes. us. Yes. That's at some point in time. When, whenever we get to that point, yeah. Yeah, yeah but we don't well, know. We need, to, we need to keep moving because, yes? The thing that puzzles me about this whole thing if you take what we have in the Bible, it's almost like the flood was localized. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the world as we know it today, had they had time to populate the whole world? No. That's kind of what you would think, but somewhere this world did a twist on itself and things spread out to what we have today. Mm -hmm. So y you wonder how many years and how long did it take them to get yeah. a populace that got this bad? Yeah. And and getting back to some stuff earlier, if Adam and Eve were supposed to look after the Garden of Eden, there sure was not enough people to take care of all the world around it, so that would have contributed to the whole decay. Well, let's go to Abram. We need to go to Abram, Abraham. He came from Ur or Haran. Um, and why did God ask him to leave Ur or Haran? There's a verse we usually don't take into account because it's not a part of the original Abraham story. It's found in, hold on, it's found in Genesis, I'm sorry, not Genesis, in Judges. It's my understanding. 24 or 2, and I, I don't know. I'd, or is it Joshua? It's my understanding Joshua. that the environment there in Haran was not, was, was not a good place to be, which is odd because that's where Abraham's family was. Mm -hmm. well, well, his family was, was pagan, were Going Joshua, into heathenism. Joshua 24 2 says, Joshua said to all the people, now, you know, is this just Joshua's idea? Is he not telling us the truth? Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, has to say. So he claims he's quoting God. Long ago, your ancestors lived on the other side of the river Euphrates and worshiped other gods. One of those ancestors was Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor. Does that mean Abraham was worshiping other gods? Your ancestors? He certainly would have been exposed to it. Oh, absolutely. So he was told to leave. It's probably to leave his family. It's not necessarily to get to a different place because when he ended up migrating somewhere else, there were kings that were pretty bad there too. They were. He, did, he didn't end up in a place where they weren't worshiping idols. I mean, there's Egyptians going up and down that Here, area. And here's, here's the question. Is it easier to maintain your spiritual identity and be separate if you're among a bunch of people who are clearly not related to you? Or is it easier if you're with your family who are in the process now worshiping idols? It's going to be hard not to associate with your family. And we see that incident ha repeating several times down through the Bible. God says, if you stay here among the people you're associating with right now, you're just going to disappear. You're going to melt into them. You will never hear from you again. God says, you've got to get out of here. He did that with, with, with Jacob and his family, got them out of Canaan because they were starting to marry pagan wives took them down to Egypt where they were despised by the Egyptians, so they had a period of time when they were sort of isolated, they had a chance to go into a nation. So. Well, what about Lot, though? 
he got he went down to Sodom and Gomorrah and he lived there. Yes, and what happened? Well, the place got torn up, but looking at him and his family, it doesn't really mention that that he was he had daughters. Well, they didn't stop. He, he didn't go with them lost, out of there. He lost almost everything. Everything, yeah. And he ended, he took what he what he got out of Sodom was two perverted daughters. He became like the people of Sodom. Very much. Well, then why did God save him? Because he was Abraham. a little bit not that not there. Yeah. <laughs> well, the New the Testament degree. calls him righteous Lot, so I hope he really was. Well, as Abraham. Abraham spent time in Haran, and later in Canaan, he convinced a large number of converts, and this is something we usually don't even think about, to join his entourage and become faithful servants of God. And I'm going to quote here from Ellen White. This is uh, a little bit of a lengthy passage, Education 187, paragraph 2. God called Abraham to be a teacher of his word. So now, Abraham was, to, was the father of the faithful, wasn't he supposed to be the example for everybody else? Yeah. And that would seem to be the, the idea, right? He chose him to be the father of a great nation because he saw that Abraham would instruct his children and his household in the principles of God's law in Genesis 26, 5. And that which gave power to Abraham's teaching was the influence of his own life. His great household consisted of more than a thousand souls, many of them heads of families, and not a few, but newly converted from heathenism. So why, how did they get to be newly converted from heathenism? He converted them. He converted them. Such a household required a firm hand at the helm. No weak, vacillating methods would suffice. Of, of Abraham, God said, I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, Genesis 18, 19. Yet his authority was exercised with such wisdom and tenderness that hearts were won. The testimony of the divine watcher is, they shall keep the way of the Lord to ju do justice and judgment. And Abraham's influence extended beyond his own household. When, wherever he pitched his tent, he set up beside it the altar for sacrifice and worship. When the tent was removed, the altar remained. And many a roving Canaanite... Now, what's your general attitude and your understanding from the Bible of Canaanites? Heathen, wicked. Yes. Heathen and wicked. Many a roving Canaanite whose knowledge of God had been gained from the life of Abraham his servant tarried at that altar to offer sacrifice to Jehovah. What does that mean? He was a missionary. He was a missionary. And he had influence. I mean, we know the Bible says at one point in time he went off to make war. He took 318 of his own men, warriors, trained in war, and conquered the enemy. So here we read that he had a thousand people, many of them heads of households, that were part of his, part of his household. You know, we think about him. Well, he rushed down to Egypt there with his wife and lied about his, Egypt, his wife. I mean, where were these thousand households? Well, then we come to Genesis 22. What happens in Genesis 22? Abraham. He had he was called by God to sacrifice the promised son, right? Why would God ask him to do that? I mean, this was a traditional thing in societies in his day. Would you consider that murder? Or was that an offering? I've, I've puzzled over that. I think many people have. I don't know if this is the correct assumption or not, but um, I came to the assumption that that was, um, it was kind of like uh, a Job experience. Yeah. Job's experience was the universe was watching to see this faithfulness. And the only uh, conclusion I can come to with this instance with Abraham, it seems like it gives everybody a puzzle, mm -hmm. even the biggest theologians. And it just seems to me that God, once again, is using this circumstance to demonstrate, you know, here's somebody faithful, watch this. Yeah. I don't know if that's correct, but, but well, that, that, that's my conclusion. At least one part of your conclusion has to be correct, and that is, 
whenever God had a really faithful person, he had to make the most of it. I mean, right. what was going on around him, you know? Well, Abraham well, had messed up several times before. Yeah. He had misrepresented God by lying about Sarah being his sister. Well, she was his half-sister, yeah. but really she was his wife. And, and took he did Hagar. that to the Egypt. He did that twice to Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Took took Hagar and as yeah. a wife to. You know, I uh, I think we overlook something there, in that uh, when we find ourselves our our own faith tested mm -hmm. in whatever way or our mm -hmm. relationship to God, that's probably what's happening there. Yeah. God is wanting, he's, he's, it's, and we whine and we complain, but really what is happening there is probably God is, is providing an opportunity for us to demonstrate our faithfulness, which is, I'm going to, which is kind of, Scary. I'm going to take a couple of minutes now and read you a fairly lengthy passage from Ellen White because it's incredible what she says about this. It was to impress Abraham's mind with the reality of the gospel as well as to test his faith that God commanded him to slay his son. The agony which he endured during the dark days of that fearful trial was permitted that he might understand from his own experience something of the greatness of the sacrifice made by the infinite God for man's redemption. And I remember that we're talking about the great controversy here. What are the angels learning as they watch this? No other test could have caused Abraham such torture of soul as did the offering of his son. God gave his son to a death of agony and shame. The angels who witnessed the humiliation and soul anguish of the Son of God were not permitted to interpose, as in the case of Isaac. There was no voice to cry, it is enough. To save the fallen race, the King of Glory yielded up his life. What stronger proof can be given of the infinite compassion and love of God? Quote, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans 8, 32. The sacrifice required of Abraham was not alone for his own good, nor solely for the benefit of succeeding generations. Now that would be us but it was also for the instruction of the sinless intelligences of heaven and of other worlds. Here we're talking about the great controversy here. The field, the field of the controversy between Christ and Satan, the field on which the plan of redemption is wrought out, is the lesson book of the universe. Because Abraham had shown a lack of faith in God's promises, Satan had accused him before the angels and before God of having failed to comply with the conditions of the covenant and as unworthy of its blessings. God desired to prove the loyalty of his servant before all heaven, to demonstrate that nothing less than perfect obedience can be accepted and to open more fully before them the plan of salvation. Heavenly beings were witnesses of this scene as the faith of Abraham and the submission of Isaac were tested. The trial was far more severe than that which had been brought upon Adam. Compliance with the prohibition laid upon our first parents involved no suffering, but the command to Abraham to demanding that most, uh, demanded the most agonizing sacrifice. All heaven beheld with wonder and admiration Satan's unfaltering, I'm sorry, Abraham's unfaltering obedience. All heaven applauded his fidelity. Satan's accusations were shown to be false. Does that say something about the great controversy? God declared to his servant, Now I know that thou fearest God, notwithstanding Satan's charges, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. God's covenant, confirmed to Abraham by an oath before the intelligence of, the other, of other worlds, testified that obedience will be rewarded. It had been difficult even for the angels to grasp the mystery of redemption, to comprehend that the commander of heaven, the Son of God, must die for guilty man. When the command was given to Abraham to offer up his son, the interest of all heavenly beings was enlisted. What does that mean? Who is watching? The entire universe is focused on what's happening here with Abraham. Okay? With intense earnestness, they watched each step in the fulfillment of this command. 
went to Isaac's question, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham made answer, Abraham made answer God will provide himself a lamb. And when the father's hand was stayed as he was about to slay his son, and the ram which God had provided was offered in the place of Isaac, then light was shed upon the mystery of redemption, and even the angels understood more clearly the wonderful provision that God had made for man's salvation. 1 Peter 1.12 Patriarchs and Prophets 154-155 That's incredible. Was this the first time Satan was shown to be wrong? To the universe? No. no. But every time God can do it, he needs to do it. Because so often Satan claims to be right. Well, did Abraham ever, ever sort of figure out what that was all about? I Forgive me, but I need to quote again. Did Abraham ever understand why God asked him to sacrifice Isaac on Mount Moriah? Abraham, now I'm quoting again, this is um, Ellen White, Desire of Ages 464-8. Abraham had greatly desired to see the promised Savior. He offered up the most earnest prayer that before his death he might behold the Messiah, and he saw Christ. What's the relationship between Messiah and Christ? Different language. Messiah is Hebrew, Christ is Greek. Same word exactly. And it means anointed. Anoint the anointed one. A supernatural light was given him. That's to Abraham now. And he acknowledged Christ's divine character. He saw his day and was glad. He was given a view of the divine sacrifice for sin. How do we know that's true? Jesus quotes that in... John 8. Jesus himself said to the Sanhedrin, the, the religious leaders in his day, Abraham saw my day and was glad. Of this sacrifice, he had an illustration in his own experience. The command came to him, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. Offer him for a burnt offering. Genesis 22, 2. Upon the altar of sacrifice, he laid his, the son of... His, he laid the son of promise, the son in whom his hopes were centered. Then as he waited beside the altar with knife upraised to obey God, he heard a voice from heaven saying, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. The, uh, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Genesis 22:12. This terrible ordeal was imposed upon Abraham that he might see the day of Christ. So what's going on here? So great, that, so great that to raise it from its degradation, he gave his only begotten son to, be a most, to a most shameful death. So was Abraham aware that the universe was watching all of this? I wish I knew that. <laughs> we know it was true. I mean, did Job know? Apparently not. So my, my, At some I, point I, in time, he apparently did, or yes. probably did, but yeah. probably not when it was happening. A, a follow-up question to this is, is that we have this information. Yes. And you mentioned last night, last uh, broadcast, that it's largely through Ellen White that this, this <laughs> it's in the scripture, but it's usually we need it pretty to well. We need to find it. That's right. So my next question is, are... are, are, are are we the only ones that, that know this? Was, is, was Noah aware of this? Was Elijah aware of this? Was Ezekiel aware of this? Was Peter aware of this? Or are we the only ones that really have a good look at this? Because well, Ellen, because we have Ellen, the, 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 the materials that Ellen White has provided yeah. for us. Well, we, if we can believe her, she suggested that Enoch knew. There's a apocryphal pseudepigraphical book that says Abraham I mean Enoch saw the second coming of Christ what about David and Moses and, and all those guys Abraham things? here and others we we know that others saw so we don't know how many people God chose to reveal all this to um, it looks like maybe he revealed it to Isaiah maybe he revealed it to Isaac, to Isaac I mean to Ezekiel he, he revealed he apparently revealed it to Daniel so there were people along the way that got this message. Well, how did Abraham know? Now I'm quoting from another passage from Ellen White. How did Abraham know of the coming of the Redeemer? 
God gave him light in regard to the future. He looked forward to the time when the Savior should come to this earth, his divinity revealed by humanity. By faith, he saw the world's Redeemer coming as God in the flesh. He saw the weight of guilt lifted from the human race and borne by the divine substitute. Manuscript 33, 1911, Volume 1 of the SDA Bible Commentary, 1092, Paragraph 4. So, what do we know about the Abraham experience then? Do we know what Abraham was doing during those three days walking to Mount Moriah? Well, I'm sure he prayed a lot. Ellen White again, I mean, excuse me for quoting her so often, but she really helps us with these stories. He didn't sleep a wink for those three days. He was praying to God, talking to God solid for 72 hours. I'm probably wondering why, why is this is the gift that I have yeah. been given and promised, mm -hmm. and now I'm going to have to go what, up there. What conclusion did he come to? Now this you can get from the Bible. Well, he eventually mm -hmm. says the Lord himself will pro provide himself a sacrifice. He said one of two things, either God will provide a substitute or he will raise my son. Both of those pictures he clearly, Hebrews tells us. Hebrews eleven nineteen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But still, even, even though he had confidence in that, wondered, he must have wondered, why are we going through all of this if that's going to happen? So, I'm asking you, clearly now it says that Abraham survived this because of his faith. What does that mean? The relationship he had with God. The relationship he had with God. Do you think any of us might have to, if we, if we live through the end of this world's history, might have to exercise faith like that? Well, I'm, I think if we were asked to sacrifice or take our children out and put them on a rock and take their lives, we, we would question our faith. Yes. Well, I don't think God, I don't, I, I don't think Satan would make the mistake of asking us to do that because it's so strange in, in our society. It, it was kind of accepted in that society. Yes. But mm -hmm. I'm sure Satan is going to come up with Temptations that are going to ring us, just put us through the ringer. Well, let's look at Jacob and Esau. A very sad story. We don't have a chance to, to go through the details. Jacob, at the suggestion of his mother, cheated and deceived his blinded father. His brother became angry. What happened? Jacob was forced to flee. Where did he flee? Right back to where uh, God, that's right, where, right back to where God had told Abraham to leave. Yeah. Well, fleeing through the desert, what, what happened to him? He slept one night on the open ground with a stone as a pillow. Can you imagine it? And what happened during that time? Two things. He saw a vision of this ladder going up to heaven. And God promised him what? Do you remember? Many said, children. Yeah. This whole land that you're walking through will be given to your descendants. Was he the first one to have that promise given to him? Abraham had that. Abraham had that promise. Isaac had that promise. Now Jacob had been given that same promise. Well, Jacob had a little problem after 20 years with his father-in-law, and he decided it was time to go back to Canaan. Does God do that to us? I, I picture Jacob here. He's leaving. He's discouraged. Everything he's hoped for appears to be over with. And God, I picture this as God is coming down and just reaffirming this promise, reminding Jacob or encouraging him, saying, you know, it isn't all over. Yeah. Does God do that with us when we're in... Well, that's a wonderful question because I'm going to ask you the other side. Did Satan have anything to do with all that business? Where was Satan in Jacob's story? Well, We're talking about a great controversy here. Did, did Satan have something to do with the deception of Isaac? 
I'm betting yes. Mm -hmm. Did he have something to do with his flight to Laban in Haran? I, th I think he had something. Uh, I've often wondered if Rachel was not a, the, the best choice of a wife for, for Isaac, but yeah. uh, because she came, they went right back down there and, and picked a wife for Isaac from the very people that Abraham had been told to get away from. So I've often wondered about that. But and we, we discussed that at the very beginning. He yeah. was, he was our, our, propos our proposition was that the reason Abraham was told to leave Haran was to get away from his corrupt relatives. Like Laban. Right. And, and here Abraham okay. sends, sends Eliezer to go back down there and try and find a wife for Okay, and, and Rachel, I'm, I'm, I'm with you 100%. So where was Isaac supposed to get a wife? You wanted to have a pagan wife? Well, I, I know there's got to be the other choices. There's got to be some of the. I mean, there's got to be a thousand. You said there was a thousand people yeah. there. So there's got to be somebody in there they could have gotten one from. Yeah, I would have thought so, huh? Anyway, and now Jacob. Do you think Satan had anything to do with Jacob's ending up with four wives? You bet. Mm -hmm. What about his flight back to Canaan? Where was Satan when they had that? When Jacob had that fight at the at the river Jack, the Jebek Jebek River, or the Jebek Stream, whatever you call it, want to call it? Was Satan anywhere around when that happened? Who was fight, who was he fighting with? He's fighting with the Lord, angel. Yeah. He called it an angel, and then he said, no, it's God. Well, God had to preserve Jacob's life by giving a vision first to Laban, say, do not harm this man, and then to Esau. If you read the story carefully. So, what about that? I mean, it, it just almost seems like when God finds someone who's coming close to, do, even close to doing what he wants, he's got to like put his arms around that guy or that person, that woman, whatever it is, and just do everything he can to protect them, to try to, you know, at least represent his side in the great controversy a little bit. Now what about Joseph? Where do we go with a Joseph story? How did the Joseph story start? Well, he ended up with some bum brothers. <laughs> <laughs> the jo bum brothers ended up with him, but finally, he was a end, end jo of life. Joseph was a spoiled brat. Yes, I was going to say, father was softer on him than the rest. Well, do you think there maybe was a reason for that? Look at what some of those other brothers did. Yeah, they weren't angels, that's for sure. Well, it was the wife that he came from, for one thing. So it was all the bad influence of those women once again. Be careful now. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, again, I'm going to ask you, what do you think the onlooking universe learned from the ex experiences of Joseph? I mean, think right from the very beginning. He's, he's a spoiled brat in some ways. We're going to read about that in a moment. But not only that, he gets these visions. Now, if you had a vision, thinking, you know, from your perspective, from our perspective, each one of us here today, if we got a vision, we saw, and we believe it, really believe it came from God, that the rest of our family is going to bow down to us, would you go blabbing about it? Or would you think it's best to keep quiet about something like that? Keep the lid on it. <laughs> well, but, I mean, if you're given this, this information, one would think that you're supposed to, I mean, is this, was this something he's just supposed to keep to himself? Or well, was this something that he was supposed to relate to everyone well, else? That's why I'm asking you, what do you think? Do you think God intended for them to, I mean, did that, you think that improved his relationship with his brothers? Maybe the problem was the way he related it. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I think it was that he related it. Both. And where is Satan in all of this? Well, if we're, if we're, if we're saying that uh, the part of the problem 
<clears throat> that he faced was because he related this information. The information pertained to what was going to happen many years later, or um, it was it pertained was going to pertain to something else. But because of the consequences of what happened here, you 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 don't think maybe God had an idea what was going to happen? Who do you think gave him these visions? Well, but what what. Well, I think what Gordon is implying there is because he had this vision and he related the vision, then the brothers got angry with him. No, they were already angry with him. And sold him off into slavery. Yeah. And um, the vision pertained to, appears to have pertained to what occurred to him mm -hmm. eventually in slavery. But maybe that was God's following the fulfillment of his vision. Maybe, maybe they, the God's. Um, um, vision here was for something that was his plan was not what was going to happen later on was but was going to happen without Joseph going into slavery yeah. this was a relationship without Joseph going into s slavery but he ended up in there and God fulfilled the is that making some sense my rattling on yeah a little bit <laughs> <laughs> well let me read makes what, perfect right. sense in here <laughs> <laughs> let me let me read to you what Ellen White said once again. Meanwhile, Joseph with his captors. Now, remember he went up there looking for his brothers. They heard him. They saw him coming with that fancy coat on. They tore the coat off, threw him in a pit, dug him out, or pulled him out, sold him as a slave. So now he's riding with these captors down, or probably walking. He probably didn't ride. He probably walked with his captors. Was on their way to Egypt. As the caravan, caravan moved southward toward the borders of Canaan, the boy could discern in the distance the hills among which lay his father's tents. You think he tried to say to those people, you know what, if you take me right over there, you'll get a lot more from me than you ever will get in Egypt. Maybe they knew if they, if they went over there with him. Well, I don't know. I'm going to say they might get into trouble. Okay. They may have said, we have a schedule to keep. Yeah. Bitterly he wept at, at thought of that loving father in his loneliness and affliction. Again the scene at Dothan came up before him. He saw his angry brothers and felt their fierce glances bent upon him. The stinging, insulting words that had met his agonizing entreaties were ringing in his ears. With a trembling heart he looked forward to the future. What a change in situation from the tenderly cherished son, the spoiled brat, to the despised and helpless slave. Alone and friendless, what would be his lot in the strange land to which he was going? For a time, Joseph gave himself up to the uncontrolled grief and terror. Imagine it. But in the providence of God, even this experience was to be a blessing to him. He had learned in a few hours that which years might not otherwise have taught him. And what was that? What do you think? Stiffened his spine. Yeah. He said, you know, I've got to, I've, I've got to, I've got to make my way in this world without Papa taking care of me. And it's to rely on, on God. On God. Mm -hmm. His father, strong and tender as his love had been, had done him wrong by his partially, partiality and indulgence. This unwise preference had angered his brothers and provoked them to the cruel deed that had separated him from his home. Its effects were manifest also in his own character. Faults had been encouraged that were now to be corrected. He was becoming self-sufficient and exacting. Accustomed to the tenderness of his father's care, he felt that he was unprepared to cope with the difficulties before him in the bitter, uncared-for life of a stranger and a slave. Then his thoughts turned to his father's God. In his childhood, he had been taught to love and fear him. Often in his father's tent, he had listened to the story of the vision that Jacob saw as he fled from his home, an exile and a fugitive. He had been told of the Lord's promise, promises to Jacob and how they had been fulfilled, how in the hour of need the angels of God had come to instruct, comfort, and protect him. And he learned of the love of God in providing for, uh, for men a redeemer. Now all these precious lessons came vividly before him. Joseph believed that the God of his fathers would be his God. He then and there gave himself fully to the Lord, and he prayed that the keeper of Israel would be with him in the land of exile. His soul, thrilled with the high resolve to prove himself true to God under all circumstances, 
to act as become became a subject of the king of heaven he would serve the lord with undivided heart he would meet the trials of his lot with fortitude and perform every duty with fidelity one day's experience had been the turning point in joseph's life its terrible calamity had transformed him from a petted child to a man thoughtful courageous and self-possessed patriarchs and prophets 213 and 214 and i should say before we run out of time here that if you want these materials that we're producing, that we've produced here for uh, use in studying this lesson, they're available on our website at theox, that's T H E O X dot O R G. And some of these materials, we don't even cover everything that's, no, that we have before more, us here. And more than the materials than what we've had a chance to talk to. Well, try to place yourself in the position of one of those brothers. When they went down to Egypt the second time to get food with Benjamin with them, and suddenly what happened? Ellen White said, well, even the Bible tells us. Joseph finally, Joseph's been sp speaking to them through a translator. He doesn't want them to know who he is. Finally, he cries out to all the Egyptians in the room, leave the room. He's in the room himself and his brothers, and he said in Hebrew, I am Joseph. Try to imagine yourself <laughs> yourself as one of the brothers at that point. Concerned. <laughs> Concerned? <laughs> That's a very gentle word. <laughs> wow. Here's this guy dressed like an Egyptian of noble birth, royal birth, you know, with all this power and so forth. He had, oh man. Well, you couldn't imagine that happening as far as the brothers are concerned. Anything like that, and to have him there in front of them. We sometimes joke about sibling rivalry, man. <laughs> but about that family. I think the thoughts were, prepare to meet thy doom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he had been pretty rough on them already, hadn't he? Well. I hope you've get, gotten some ideas about the challenges of looking at these stories and trying to incorporate not only the ideas that might teach us something about God, but what might teach us something about the devil as well. Our wonderful Father, we've had a chance now to look at briefly, look at some stories in the book of Genesis. We've seen some terrible problems from the human side, and yet on your side, some wonderful solutions, but yet it seems like you had very few of the human family that were willing to even listen to you. Now we look at this end of human history, we recognize how people are turning away from you once again. Help us to stand firm on your side to represent you correctly as we approach the end of this world's history is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.